call me old fashioned, call me whatever. Uh, swimming with dolphins is not rock and roll. I'm Arizona Family Political Editor Dennis Welch. Dennis, fake news Welch, try to tell the truth. And this is the Politics Unplugged podcast. Dennis, if you have a problem with substance abuse, I am more than willing to talk to you anytime you need. And welcome back to the Politics Unplugged podcast. And this week, I am pleased to be joined by a reporter extraordinaire from the Arizona Republic, Ron Hansen. Ron, thanks so much for stopping by here um, and giving us a little bit of your time. Thanks for having me, Dennis. Anytime. Yeah, yeah we're going uh, wanted, to uh, wanted to chat with you a little bit. Uh, you know, it's campaign finance reports time. Um, you know, you've been covering the U.S. Senate race very closely for the Republican doing just really a great job with that. And I wanted to start with uh, the campaign finances here and the, like the top line numbers. What are you seeing? What are you making of this? You know, there's a couple different storylines here. I think number one is that Ruben Gallego raised whatever it was, $21 million. Yeah. It's a, a pretty uh, healthy amount of money on its own. He also spent a little bit more than that in this latest period. It's what a well-financed campaign looks like at crunch time. They entered October uh, relatively liquid with uh, the funds that they should need to be able to uh, get this thing uh, where they want it to be mm -hmm. after months of just inundating all of us <laughs> with – uh, you know, commercials everywhere on every screen you can find in Arizona. When you look at Carrie Lake's campaign, yeah. she had another good quarter for her, but it's not nearly enough to keep pace with Ruben Gallego. She and there raised was, eight. There was some debt there, too, again. Yeah. I mean, she, yeah, I believe, I believe she ended the quarter with like four, nearly four and a half million dollars cash on hand, but she also had two million dollars worth of debt. Right. And the debt keeps going up. Mm -hmm. That's That was the other part of this. So she had a pretty good quarter for raising money, but she's also not paying some of the bills that are going to be owed on this. She does dispute at least two of the bills uh, for this latest quarter mm -hmm. that together add up to about a million dollars worth of disputed debt at this point. But the bottom line is, in Lake's case, it's the story of a campaign that has done okay, but not spectacular and continues to be short on resources at the time you really need to be hitting the gas right now. Yeah, and maybe explain a little bit about that because like, let, let's say even if there was a big in, uh, influx of cash for any of these campaigns right now, at this point in the campaign, it's doesn't help a whole lot because a lot of the ads, a lot of stuff like that, that, it's already been spoken for. It's already been booked. It may even be hard to find a printer at this time that doesn't have a job. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Of course, the important thing in, in campaigns and politics and trying to get your message out is not just that you have the money, but also that you have the message, that you have the space, the ability to get it out there and have it in a sustained way. Mm -hmm. So you don't just put an ad together People need to see that ad multiple times. Uh, I've had people say, you know, at least 10 times before the ad really sort of sinks in and, and begins to uh, move things the way you are. And even more than that, if you're Carrie Lake, if, if polls are correct at all, she has consistently trailed in this campaign. And what that means is she needs to be coming from behind in this. So she can't just keep pace with Ruben Gallego. She needs to outpace him in messaging and such. That's where this campaign uh, finance issue really manifests itself that yes she has okay money but he has more and she needs to come from behind that's hard to do and she doesn't seem to be getting a lot of support from the republicans she needs to get support from back in dc like the mcconnell the victory pack not really playing very much in this race i believe and correct me if i'm wrong i mean I think, you know, Republicans are na nation nationwide, national Republicans spending more money on the Maryland Senate race than Carrie Lake's Senate race. I mean, what? Uh, yeah, what well, why is that? You know, you talk about Republicans nationally who are not on board with Carrie Lake. And, mm -hmm. and of course, one name towers above all the others. That is Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell mm -hmm. and his allies who have always sort of cast the longest shadow in GOP uh, Senate campaigns in terms of extra money to be force multipliers for candidates uh, around the country. 
McConnell has talked uh, not so subtly about candidate quality issues. Mm -hmm. He is not a fan of Carrie Lake, and that's very evident. He has put no money behind her campaign and has no indication that that's going to change. Uh, And that applies to all his allies. And what it means is that for her, she has the nominal support of Republicans in D.C., but not the leader and the people who are most connected to him. And at the same time, she's also been sort of struggling, I think, to uh, bring on board high-profile Republicans in Arizona. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the worst of all worlds. You can uh, bring a lot of uh, people, Republican senators from across the country, to Phoenix, and she has. But a lot of people wouldn't recognize Mike Lee if they saw him. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet... There are, you know, very few appearances with Doug Ducey or Karen Taylor Robeson, certainly the McCain family. There's just <laughs> lots of names you can imagine that would be going around with her if she had that kind of support that people vocally really wanted to embrace her. We haven't seen that. Yeah, it's been interesting. And real quick before we kind of move on, how do you explain Ruben's fundraising prowess? I mean, it's not... Mark Kelly numbers. I mean, those are no pun intended to the moon, <laughs> like those kinds of numbers. Um, but how do, how do you explain? These are very, very good numbers. Is it a fact? Is it a factor that Arizona was seen as one of those uh, key Senate races, uh, battleground? Maybe they could, you know, you know, to keep to keep this seat. Um, is it seen as that or is there something else to it? You know, I think this election cycle always began with great angst for Democrats. Mm-hmm. They had Senator Kirsten Cinema, who defected and, and switched from Democrat to independent at, at the end of 2022. Ruben got in a month later, and it, it sort of had the effect of burning the bridges. It, Democrats knew they had to get behind Ruben Gallego. They had no alternative. They were fearful that there might be a three-way race. This would uh, this looked like a very difficult race for them. Mm-hmm. I think it just forced a lot of folks to get where they wanted to go. And let's remember, with Ruben Gallego, you're talking about somebody who was in good standing with the left wing of the Democratic Party at the time, which can't hurt with fundraisers. Um, you know, cinema's criticism largely came from that element of the party. And the moderates, you know, by the time she dropped out, really had nowhere to go. They had to pick between Ruben or Kerry. It has just sort of helped uh, keep Ruben uh, afloat financially. So, what do you what do you, what do you hear from the, uh, the Republicans that you speak to? Is this another issue of like it's it's a candidate quality issue? Yeah, it's candidate quality, and frankly, they've got better options. Yeah, uh, and I think that that has a lot to do with it. Is I think of Arizona's race every day just because that's where I'm at, and that's what I need to focus on. But you know, you look at the math of retaking the Senate; they need to win West Virginia. They've checked that box yeah. uh, with John Manchin out. They need Montana. Uh, they're way ahead in the polls on that last I checked. They're close to checking that box. And then it really comes down to Ohio. This is a state that really leans red now at this point. They're in a tough race. They've poured a lot of resources into that. And they think that that alone, those three races, get them the majority. Mm-hmm. And then they look at some of the other options. with uh, The races in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania – uh, maybe even Michigan seem to be moving more in their direction at this point. All of that has a factor in how much resources and attention somebody will get in Arizona mm-hmm. and with Kerry Lake as, as the person that they need to be partnering with. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me because I, I, I wouldn't have expected at this point in the race at the start of the year that, uh, you know, the polls would be showing, you know, a healthy lead. I mean, some of these polls, double digits. Um, I don't think it's going to be uh, that kind of a, a victory uh, for the Democrat in in this race, but it certainly seems like it's not not as nearly as competitive as I thought it would, it would be going into the race. And I also got a I'm getting I've gotten a different vibe from the late campaign this time around than I did two years ago. Um, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Because what I'm I'm hearing uh, from a lot of you know Republicans, even those that want to that support her. It's like it seems like she there's no new tricks. It's all become kind of shtick at this point. Um, and she's, again, not broadened her support out there. She said she wanted to try to do that, but she hasn't done that in terms of any kinds of actions she's taken. No, I think that's right. There was I, when she entered the race, mm-hmm. there was an attempt, I think, at creating this narrative that this is a different kind of Carrie Lake, maybe uh, someone who is moderating in some sense. 
I never saw any evidence of that. No. There was nothing in what she said right from the jump or any of the months that followed after that. She was very uh, uh, conscious about trying to consolidate support among Republicans, mm -hmm. especially at that time. It looked like there might be a three-way race. If you had only Republicans, that would probably win. Uh, but in a two-way race, when cinema dropped out, that kind of an approach really kind of left them with, uh, again, the very limited appeal that didn't work in 2022. Mm -hmm. And I think that has left her um, uh, in a tough place and that the, uh, you know, the, the dynamics of this race have just never worked in the direction she had hoped. And you don't see, like, the crowds that she used to draw from the governors. And, and I got to say that looking at the primary results, I think she got 55 percent in the primary. That had to be super concerning for her heading into the general election that she was only going to get. She only got, you know, 55 percent instead of more yeah. against a non really an unfunded campaign candidate in Mark Lamb. Absolutely. So Sheriff Lamb just was not able to compete financially in this race. He didn't bring on board a single prominent endorsement. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, he said that he wasn't seeking endorsements. Uh, <laughs> it was the kind of thing that uh, he has some name ID, but it's not nearly the sort of recognition and, and fully formed national figure that Kerry Lake has become. Uh, and in about two weeks before early voting got underway, uh, in this uh, Republican primary, the campaign put out a statement that said that there was no need to debate Sheriff Lamb because they were 30 points up. Yeah. She won by 16 points. So it was a startling sort of underperformance uh, by the measuring stick her own campaign had put out mm -hmm. uh, not long before the primary. And I think, again, it just sort of the deepened the reserves uh, that people had about her, that they felt uh, this is, again, a rerun of a show that they didn't like two years ago. Yeah, and I, I think also, too, uh, you know, maybe you can add or, or disagree with me that Ruben really benefited by getting in this race so early. He had, you know, the road to himself for basically a year to redefine himself. I mean, because he was in good standing with the left progressive part of the party, which works in his Phoenix district, <laughs> doesn't work for a statewide race. Um, one of the things I've been struck by with this campaign uh, with him and the worry going in was, can can Ruben be disciplined? And he's been disciplined to the point of, an, of annoying a reporter like me who remembers when he was a lot less, a lot less disciplined, a little more loose with what he used to say. Yeah, he, uh, he has run a remarkably steady campaign. Mm -hmm. This is something that... Uh, having seen the cinema campaign and two versions of Mark Kelly and then uh, the Gallego campaign, what stands out in this era for Democrats is the ability to avoid na uh, just nasty primaries that mm -hmm. would have divided the party and, and left people feeling uh, stung and uh, threatening to withhold support and such. When Ruben got in, it sort of uh, had the effect of stifling anybody else from getting in. There was uh, some speculation that Congressman Greg Stanton might enter the race. That didn't happen. And it, again, with Kirsten Cinema as a possible uh, magnet pulling away at least some Democratic votes it, at the outset, that was the fear. Mm -hmm. I think it really had the effect of driving a lot of Democrats into Team Gallego from the start, and they've never looked back. And he has done to his credit, uh, a really good job of staying on message and avoiding the kinds of controversies that might have distracted from his campaign. And so we, when you look at all this as like, you know, uh, Carrie Lake's uh, down in the polls, down in the fundraising, it seems like she's looking to toward, uh, you know, to try to change the momentum of this campaign. And it seems like she put a lot of stock, it appeared this way, into what would be in the divorce records with Ruben Gallego in his seven year uh, seven year div uh, ago divorce from Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego? Uh, the, it was a conservative news outlet, the Free Beacon, I believe it was back back, back east, that had sued to unseal those records. And after a lengthy court battle, those records were unsealed this past week, and it really was just. You know, the term nothing burger has been thrown out there a lot because there wasn't much in that camp in, in, in those documents. In fact, the Yavapai County judge overseeing this case initially uh, said from the bench, he called it a garden variety um, divorce. But that didn't stop Lake in her her campaign from from speculating 
on that? What, what's your, been your take on this? Yeah, I, I think this has really uh, been deflating mm-hmm. for uh, the Lake campaign. There, This was seen, especially coming off the debate performance that she had, where I think she had a, a strong debate. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, that there was some hope that maybe there's momentum. This is exactly the right time to be catching fire. You have this divorce that will now become public. Um, it's not a good look for Ruben Gallego, no matter how you cut it. But again, it's not new either. There had been some hope, I think, that the file would contain some information that that built on this not good look. Mm -hmm. And instead, it was really, um, yeah, as the judge put it, it it was pretty garden variety. And I think that was, if there's any takeaway, it was that, that there was nothing remarkable about it. And if you feel, you know, anything, it's, it's for Kate Gallego in all of this. And she has supported Ruben Gallego in the Senate race. Mm-hmm. So it sort of puts a check on Carrie Lake's outrage, her ability to be, um, uh, you know, using this as a mark against Ruben Gallego. If anybody knows him, it's Kate Gallego, and she has endorsed him. Yeah, and that's the key point, like, when I'm talking to their their supporters, the Lake supporters and team and whatnot. It's like... Yeah, I get it. You know, Kate may have been blindsided. She was served with divorce papers when she was nine months pregnant and all this other stuff. But you're forgetting. She endorsed him, man. And again, it's not a new story. We we knew about this seven years ago when it went down. Um, And they're trying to make some political hay out of it now. That seems to me to reek of a little bit of political desperation at this point. Yeah, and and I would just say that This has been, these last few weeks, what stands out to me, it has been especially intensely personal coming from Carrie Lake. She has referred to Ruben as dumb. She has cast doubt on his basic narrative at the debate. She said, oh, he stumbled over his telling his life story. Uh, It's almost like he's embellished it. Well, what part of it isn't true? So it's just been this intensely personal attacks on him. And to have the divorce file, which I think she had viewed as the ace in the hole, sort of turn out to be the joker in the deck yeah really was uh, a and, disappointment and for it her. has been very personal with her like it shows like and that's that starts showing a little desperation because she was been attacking his father his father was a convicted drug dealer again that's not new that 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 has been a story that's been out there from when he first ran for congress when they remember i met those ads back in the day who's the real guy because he had changed his name his last name and he changed his last name to honor his mother. <laughs> I mean, th- this this is nothing new. Yeah, and and to put some distance with his father. Yeah, and I think that again, uh, whatever you think of anybody, I, I don't know that any of us should be blamed for who we are because of our parents yeah. or anything like that. And you know, in in the context of Carrie Lake's polling, you know, USA Today did a poll uh, a few weeks ago and. What stood out about that was how underwater Carrie Lake was with people just on a human level that uh, people just more dislike her than like her. And mm-hmm. that was something that just continued through all of this. These personal attacks that she needs to bring Ruben down are not simultaneously lifting her up at the same time. And it's just left her in a spot where, again, it, it's more of the – uh, very intensely personal attacks, and it and it fell flat. Yeah, and there's something about it. She's just not connecting with voters like she did. I mean, you know, there's you go back, you look at. I mean, everybody's a lot of people keep bringing up the like, telling the McCain folks to go away. But I think one mark, one one instance in this campaign that had a lasting effect was her secret video uh, tape recording of the former uh, Republican Party chair Jeff Dewitt. I've spoken to a lot of people who feel like she double-crossed somebody who was helping her. She crossed a line, I think, that it put everybody uh, on edge Mm -hmm. as to what she might have, and it certainly put them on guard to make sure that they don't add to that moving forward. It it was just something that it was a shot across the bow, and if you want to say it it toppled Jeff DeWitt, the then chairman of the Arizona Republican Party— Yes, it did, but at what cost? Mm-hmm. And uh, you can't forget that Jeff DeWitt was also a very loyal uh, person in Trump's orbit, uh, in good standing. And so mm-hmm. to do that, I think it also put some distance between her and the former president. Yeah, and um, 
let's but before we go here i do want to talk to you too you were uh, in uh, the netflix documentary stop the steel uh, did a really great job in that uh, if you haven't watched it, it's a really interesting documentary it's on netflix now you should check it out um and it goes through uh, kind of just you know if, if you're listening to this podcast you're probably familiar with all the events but it is a good documentary it puts it all in, in in one piece there um regarding all the efforts uh, to change the outcome of the election here in Arizona and in Georgia and, you know, and ultimately the effort to, cha- to overturn the election results nationwide, the presidential election in 2020. I just want to, you know, final question for you here today. Are you seeing anything like that similar in 2024 that you saw in 2020? Not yet. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that the, uh, the caveat there is, is bothersome but I also didn't know at this point four years ago where 2020 was going to be heading. Mm-hmm. We knew in 2020 at about this stage that Arizona would be close and it was going to be intensely uh, contested, um, that the uh, specter of litigation and such, all of that is not unusual. It was not something that would have been surprising, but it was the... Uh, the effort to sidestep the results that that ensued after the election, that was the part that sort of uh, blindsided all of us. And the depths of the plans that had preceded it, that is something that has become uh, more evident now and is bothersome. I think that uh, given the largely same cast of characters in, in the important regards, you have to at least be concerned mm-hmm. that uh, there may be some effort to look for some alternate path to victory. But, um, you know, again, the uh, the process is uh, 50 state elections plus the District of Columbia and Arizona, at least our portion of it right now, doesn't appear as suspenseful as it was four years ago Uh and so maybe that means that Arizona won't be the front in this uh, this race, this election, and whatever fallout comes afterward that it proved to be four years ago. Yeah. All right, Ron, thank you so much for stopping by here, man. And hopefully uh, you'll come back here post-election and give us a, a debrief on what you saw happen. It's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks right, for thank, having me. Thanks a lot, man. And welcome back to Politics Unplugged, the back half of the podcast here, as always, joined with producer extraordinaire Colin Stan. Colin, how the hell are pleasure. you? Man? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Like, yeah, yeah, man. Big week. Another, yeah, another it, big it, week. It feels like the week wasn't quite as crazy as some of the others we've seen, but still I, a high level of crazy. I gotta say, man, it's you know, it, it, there's been a lot, of, a lot of happening, but it's less, it's less crazy the past month or so than it was over the summer it's just like every week was just something historic was happening and then you know uh, but it seems like it's kind of settled down a little bit a little you know we you know we haven't had two or three candidates in the state every single day (laughs) this week (laughs) so that's been nice but we have another one here uh, we as we tape on friday i mean for all the surrogates and all the campaigns like why the hell do you all want to come out here on a friday i know I know it kills us. It just they just. should understand we tape Friday. Yes, yes. Don't do this to us, man. No, man. Well, you know how many Wednesday uh, get what? it done by Wednesday. <laughs> we plan everything Thursday. <laughs> You're gonna come here. We're, we're Monday, we'll, Tuesday, Wednesdays are open. We will send them any camp. Uh, we'll send you our schedule. Yeah, we'll give you the team's invite. Yeah, we'll come put- here Monday, when Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wide open, man. Wide open, man. Thursday, you're kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah. Friday, Friday no, definite no, 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 pain no. in the ass. No, no, no. You're just, no. You're just, you're just effing with us at yeah. that point. Friday, you're threatening to make us work a weekend. <laughs> and, I mean, we got it's football season. We got things going on. You got Oregon. I yeah. got Iowa. Yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, so Monday no. through Wednesday. Game. Exactly. Exactly. So remember that. But uh, when's, hey, o- when's Obama going to be here? Is uh, he? I think he's here today. Is he today? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, nah, man. Monday through Wednesday. <laughs> Today being Friday. Today being Friday. Yes, yes. But uh, hey, man, that was a, a great conversation with Ron Hansen. He was from the Republic. He's he's yeah. always great. And seriously, check out the Netflix documentaries. He provides some really good insight into that. And it's just so, it's always crazy. Um, you know, I didn't want to ask him about it or anything, but uh, you know, for for 
take you behind the curtain a little bit. He's one of those guys you always see him at the the press conference, Car- the Kerry Lake press yeah. conference. will be there, and like, and you know, Ron's a really great reporter, solid reporter, straightforward man, yeah, straight shooter. Um, and uh, man, it's not a Kerry Lake press conference until they bash him, yeah, from the podium. And he's just like, man, what the hell? Yeah, it, I, I know, I it. <laughs> It, it, it's just like, well, what, what, what is going on? But yeah, just they, it won't really again. I want to thank him for joining, for for stopping by and joining, and joining I'm, the pod. I'm not sure running against the media necessarily works for them. I mean, it's one of those things that again may work for Trump. I don't think Carrie Lake um, benefits from targeting Ron Hansen and not Ruben <laughs> Gallego. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if Ron was running for Senate, yeah. it may, go maybe, for it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm not sure it's an effective strategy. Otherwise, <laughs> no. Well, well. Um, from that, let's 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 pivot um, a little bit. I think uh, talk about your political observation or your political play of the week. It's. I mean, it's hard to top the um, the lake buildup to the Gallego uh, abortion uh, case being unsealed. Oh yeah. Where I think it was on KTAR where she said people are going to be shocked. Yes, shocked. What's in there? They're going to be shocked. Shocked. Drug abuse, uh, spousal abuse, we don't know. Just wait. But don't vote until you see what's in there. Yeah. You'll be shocked. Yeah. And what was in there was absolutely nothing. Absolutely Absolutely nothing. And she's trying to push back on that, saying, no, no, no. He left her when she was nine months pregnant. We we knew that when they announced it. They announced it. Yes, they announced it. Kate Gallego announced in December, uh, we're getting a divorce. Baby's due next month. This was not, there's nothing in there of any Nothing news. <laughs> we are in the news business. Yes. There is nothing new in this. No. And you're and, acting and, like it's like this, it's just unearthed. Yeah. Was absolutely, you know, even the, the judge three, four months ago who was overseeing the, the public records case before it got kicked up for a final decision on the Supreme Court, we had video of him from the bench saying, yeah. I've reviewed this record multiple times. Yeah. And it is a one of the most garden variety divorces yes. I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's nothing in there that's even vaguely interesting. Stuff involving their child was redacted. Yeah. There were things that were redacted, but it all appeared to be regarding, you know, custody and the child and um, you know, income and stuff. Not any, there's nothing salacious there. There's nothing even vaguely salacious. There. No, nothing even close, um, man. And after all the buildup with with Carrie and her, her people building up this incredible bombshell that was coming, it just looks ridiculous. And in the middle of, of you know, after it was released and we all, and there's nothing there, I saw that she tweeted out a picture of herself with her husband and said, thank you, Jeff, for always being by my side. Come on. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's your second husband. Uh, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what are you doing? I mean, her talent in the last race she ran, statewide race, the gubernatorial race, um, just from a political strategy point, from a pol- political standpoint, was, was, was pretty impressive. She turned the fact that Kate Gallego wouldn't debate her into the issue. Uh, Katie Hobbs. Or uh, Katie Hobbs. Yeah. Uh, to the fact that Katie Hobbs wouldn't debate her into the issue of that campaign. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. From a from a PR political standpoint. And again, she's trying to turn really that something that has nothing to do with how he can legislate and how he can govern into this big issue that's going to turn the tide of this campaign for her. Yeah. Um, the judge said that, you know, he thought after people read the, you know, divorce proceedings, they were looking for any information would be rather, quote, deflated. Yeah. I think all of this did was deflate again, Carrie Lake's campaign. Yeah. And I get she's looking for a Hail Mary. You know, the polls have her losing soundly. I mean, the closest poll I've seen lately is like seven. Yeah. Others are, are double digits. So, I mean, she's looking for the Hail Mary. Um, this clearly was not it. And to try and build it up into that before it got released, yeah. it's not a great look. The political play 
of the week. Yeah. Hey, when is ever a nothing? When is when? When's the last time a nothing burger has been such big news? Well, <laughs> Al Capone's vault. Geraldo. <laughs> going back to the eighties with Geraldo, man. We need Geraldo to unseal the, <laughs> the case. What's in here? Uh, it's a dusty old Coke bottle. I thought I thought Al Capone's victims are going to be in the vault, and no, <laughs> no, he likes soda. Oh man, that's 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 the winner for the best joke I've heard about this. <laughs> you know what that would be? Twitter Gold, or the yeah. form, platform formerly yeah. known as Twitter yeah. Gold. Yeah, you know, Blue Sky Gold. Blue Sky Gold. I've tried so hard to make that shift. There's no one there. Yeah, There's no, no one a, there. It's, it's depressing. Hard. I, uh, but what, it, it's depressing for just different reasons because I don't want to get into a big discussion on this, but uh, X is just depressing for all sorts of yeah, reasons. Yeah, I want to get off of X badly. Um, I don't post there anymore and haven't for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I still read things there because there are people I want to follow yeah. who are there. And a few of them moved to Blue Sky and posted a couple times and sort of looked around and realized it was a ghost town and yeah. and that was it. Yeah, um, it's a bit like, uh, again, the differences between uh, Twitter X and some of the others is like in, in Twitter, you're screaming in a mosh pit. Yeah. And then some of these other sites, you're just screaming into a void. Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't think it would be so hard to come up with a decent alternative <laughs> Twitter. There aren't that many. I mean, Twitter has turned into Truth Social. A lot of people don't want Truth Social. They're looking for something else. Blue Sky seems like a pretty good alternative, except there's absolutely nobody there. And you know, there's a lot of ex-Twitter employees out there. <laughs> yes. Uh, for a second, it looked like it would be Threads. And my God, Threads is... Uh, the only time I see Threads is when it pops up on my Instagram feed with, mm -hmm. with posts they'll think I like. And every single time, the post they think I'll like is like, hey, I remember this one time 15 years ago when I was working retail... <laughs> And Oof. this guy was rude to me, and it sucked. It's, like you thought I wanted that, huh? A hot fucking take, man. It's, a hot, I, not, I, it's just worthless. I think I want to have a burner account on Threads that is just like just chock full with just like <laughs> lame observations. Not even dumb observations, just yeah. the lamest observations, yeah. you know. So, yeah, I was mowing my lawn, and there's a part that's sort of lumpy, and went over it, kind of scalped it, and it doesn't look as good as the rest of the lawn. <laughs> I don't know. I was walking my dog the other day, like she saw like another dog cross the street, so she just kind of stopped and stared at him. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the tweet. Yeah. That's the post. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Threads is like ninety percent. There's something that I vaguely remember from years ago that I kind of think maybe I was sort of a victim. No, Oof. thank you. No, thank you. Oof. Oof. Um, uh, let's, uh, l l l you know, we love talking about lists. Yeah. It, you know, for and regular lists. Re regular uh, listeners of the podcast or viewers or however you consume yeah. the unplugged, um, know that we like to talk about lists yeah. of music in particular. Yeah. And we don't often get the political crossover there. No, but we but, do this yeah. week. Yeah. What do we got? We got Donald Trump's dance party. What? Yeah. So um, I'm sure everyone listening knows this, but he had an event in Pennsylvania where um, he was taking questions, and there were a couple people who had medical episodes perhaps passing out in the audience, and he decided he didn't want to take any more questions. He just wanted to stand there and listen to music. So we had Donald Trump's dance party for 38 minutes. 38 minutes he stood on the stage, occasionally dancing and playing music. And we've got the playlist. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, in context, apparently there was a medical emergency. Yeah. Although a couple people passed out. It seems fairly peripheral to the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, yes, there were. Everyone seems to be okay. That doesn't really explain playing music for 38 minutes while doing the... Um, the, well, I mean, the unique it, dance move that has, he has the, has the likes dance, to break up. Is there a name for the dance yet? I've heard several. I'm not going to repeat them. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And just remember, we can swear yeah. on this podcast, yeah. and we're but still I'm not, not going to. Yeah. I'm not going there. Um, all right. Uh, shall we go through it? Let's do it. Uh, Ave Maria 
but it was not the one he wanted. It was like some easy listening kind of Ave Maria. So he uh, he asked him to yeah. play the uh, Pavarotti, the Pavarotti one. Mm-hmm. So they played that. Um, so opera. Yeah. Uh, Time to Say Goodbye by Sarah Brightman and Andrea Bocelli. I, it, you see, that, that's a weird pick. It is. I mean, you know, Time to Say Goodbye. Why would you as a president, as a former president and current candidate, Running for the White House, play a song with the title "Time to Say Goodbye." I mean, he's used stuff from Titanic, so I don't. They're not. They're not worried about the symbolism of any I of guess. these things. I guess. Man. Um, I mean, if you want one that's a little more on the nose, it's a man's 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 world by James Brown. <laughs> that sounds like someone picking a joke of what they would play at his rally. No, they played it at his rally. Um, mm. Hey, man, James Brown, man, love 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 James Brown. Yeah. Uh, YMCA by the Village People. That's a, that's standard now. He, yeah, he he loves that one. Um, and he had Christy Nome on stage with him, and she did the YMCA thing, which he doesn't do. He just does the the thing, the, <laughs> the thing, <laughs> the thing. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Hallelujah by Rufus Wainwright. <sighs> Everyone on Earth has covered Hallelujah. It's the Leonard Cohen song. Yes. Uh, Jeff Buckley has the most famous version. Rufus Wainwright does a great voice. Rufus Wainwright has a great voice. Um, he's not overly thrilled with Trump playing his version, but he said, well, he hopes that maybe at some point Trump will actually listen to it and gain a bit of humanity from it, but he's not holding his breath. Yeah. Uh, five, Nothing Compares to You by Sinead O'Connor. That's going to upset some people on it's, the left. Um, yeah, and I mean, uh, does he know her history? Like the whole tearing up the picture of the Pope? Does he stage know the history? Of Saturday Night Live? Didn't he, wasn't there some famous story about him? He didn't know much about Normandy or something? There was some big, I mean, there's, yeah. there, there was that story that was reported in the Atlantic a couple of years ago. He didn't know. <laughs> some, yeah. Some real, some real, oh, it was about Pearl Harbor or something like that. That was some real basic stuff. Yeah, don't. If you're listening to this, don't. I'm not saying that as fact. I, I have this remembrance of Trump. He didn't have something, some big historical event that yeah. you should have known, like Pearl Harbor, and you didn't know it. And so I say that in, by way of saying, is he aware of Sinead O'Connor's history? I doubt it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah. Um, an Elvis medley that included Dixieland and the Battle Hymn of the Republic. <laughs> it's on point. Uh, Rich Men North of Richmond by Oliver Anthony. Okay. Okay. Which is a, um, a weird song. Uh, uh, November Rain by Guns N' Roses. <laughs> For those listening, Dennis is shaking his head in bewilderment, not sure what to say. <laughs> well, well the, the thing I hate about that is, uh, you know, Guns N' Roses, that is when... And it's widely agreed is that's when Guns N' Roses really kind of jumped the shark. Because that was the video when Axel, the lead singer, the front man, the world's most dangerous band, man. Yeah. It's like swimming with dolphins. Was swimming with the fucking dolphins. (laughs) See, this is tricky for me because I like November Rain. I like some of the stuff from that album. But yes, it was a departure from Appetite for Destruction and moving them into an area that they didn't necessarily need to be going. No. (laughs) That's when, like, Axel, who I'm not a fan of, was he started wearing kilts all the time. Yeah. It was just... Yeah. Yeah. The budgets for for the videos just started going insane. Now Slash is walking out of a tiny church and playing a solo on a cliff. And Yeah, and Axel's swimming with dolphins, dude. Yeah. Yeah, swimming with dolphins. Yeah, it's not rock and roll, man. No, and it, and it was all downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Next uh, we heard from them was like Chinese democracy. Oh God, call well, me. No, there was the there was the one out uh, uh, the, the spaghetti the, incident. The spaghetti incident where they were doing like punk covers and yeah. stuff. I think they did a Fear cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, no one needed to hear that either. No, but I, I call me old fashioned. Call me whatever. Uh, Swimming with dolphins is not rock and roll. There's a lot of other things that are rock and roll. That is not one of them. No, it's you not know, all that rock you, and roll. You know, um, so there you go. 
Uh, and then the last one, memory from the musical Cats. Oh, boy. <laughs> and it's not a cover. It's like the actual Broadway one with a voice talking about um, Jellicle have, shit, the cats, whatever that is. Have, has it, do you know anybody, have you, or do you know anybody who's actually seen Cats? The movie or the play? Or the play. I'm sure I know people who have seen it. I mean, a lot of people saw it. I have not seen it. Yeah. I can't imagine sitting through it. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure I know any number of people who have a differing view of the musical theater I mean, than It was I on do, Broadway it. for or forever. Yeah, I'm sure it's been at Gamage. I'm, you know, I yeah, I'm <laughs> sure that there are people I know who have seen it. I don't know who I, they are, and I'll let them remain anonymous. <laughs> I, I could not imagine um, sitting through that either. No. No, part of me wants to watch the movie. <laughs> it's like the same part of me that has every single Ed Wood film on DVD. You know, I, I can watching. sit here and recite the dialogue to Plan 9 from Outer Space. Oh, boy. So the film version of Cats might be up my alley. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, yeah. But no, I haven't seen it. Yeah, there's there is that uh, kind of threshold where it's something is so bad it becomes good. Yeah, like I I wonder where that is. Yeah, I doubt it's going to be in. I I <laughs> I, I, I okay, homework assignment for you. I want you to do that report back next week. Oh, God, because I, I don't I don't think, I don't know that that's happening. I don't think you're we'll going to get through thirty minutes. No, no, yeah, odds are good. I'll I'll take a look. I'll see if it's streaming anywhere, <laughs> and maybe I'll give it a shot. But don't. Like, don't count on a complete report. No, because for me, like good bad movies are like like, like is like uh, uh, Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. That sure. is honestly just a terrible sure. movie. Yeah, but it's so terrible. It's 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 great. Have you ever seen Jim Cotta huh? with Kurt Thomas? Jim Cotta, the Kurt, the, the thrill of gymnastics, the kill of karate. I was oh I was gonna say the the gymnast. Yeah, yeah. He's um who he's was screwed being, out of a gold medal in nineteen eighty. Yeah, he's being chased by like bad guys in a village, but thankfully there's a pommel horse in the middle of the village. So he starts doing the Thomas Flair and they all run up one at a time and get hit with his legs doing the Thomas Flair and then flail off and die. I can't say I've seen that one. Jim Cotta. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, that was sort of our go to in my freshman year of college. What are we gonna do? I don't know. Guess we're gonna watch Jim Cotta. Let's go grab a few road soda, road sodas and watch some <laughs> yeah. Jim Cotta. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing. Why was film. there a pommel horse there? Was it like a legit? Because did, it's Kurt did, Thomas. Did, did they try to hide it as something else? No, or, or was they, it well, a, no. It, I don't think so. It was like a big stone pommel horse that was presented as if it was like a statue in the in the city square or something. Except it's a goddamn pommel horse. It's yeah. all it is. Well, yeah, and he like, would climb up and do the Thomas Flair and. The bad guys one at a time would run at him and get hit with his legs because I don't know if he was necessarily kicking them so much oh, as he was just doing his routine and they'd get hit and they'd fall off and die. Yeah, gymnasts aren't known for making great movies. Remember Mitch Gaylord? Yeah, what American Anthem? Yeah, is that his? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never yeah. really went anywhere. No. <laughs> hey, talking films. Just because I've been meaning to do this, the the editor who puts together this podcast for us and puts together the, all the video mm -hmm. for our TV show, Hunter Norris is now doing movie reviews on the Arizona's Family website. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does a terrific job. I think the I think the review of Smile 2 just went up mm -hmm. this week. So I wanted to give him a shout-out. and people. You know, Hunter's great, movie. man. Hunter's He's, great. Knows does, his stuff. Yeah. Love the reviews. So definitely worth checking out on uh, on the website. I think on that, maybe, we're, maybe we wrap this up unless yeah. there's something else you want to unburden, no, unburden I think I'm yourself. Good. I'll unburden myself next week. <laughs> when we get a report... On Cats the movie. Yeah. At least the opening credits. <laughs> Isn't Taylor Swift in that? Maybe I'll try and stick around until I can find the cat that looks Dude, like Taylor Swift. you're asking me? Come on, man. <laughs> I don't know. If cat and that jackass who used to have the talk show on CBS is in it, too, isn't he? That British asshole no one likes. That really narrows it down. I know. Was he used to have the late show? Uh, James Corden. Is he the one with the robot sidekick? No, he was funny. Okay. That's that's Craig Ferguson. Okay. He was good. Okay. I think he was he might have been replaced by James Corden, um, who is universally undisliked. I think he's in it. In cats? In cats, yeah. 
Well, I mean, I'll expect to learn everything from you next week. Your uh, homework I'll, assignment. I'll, yeah, I'll see Cats, how easy it is to find the movie. Hey, like, look, pl- unplug, dude. Like, uh, like politics. Like, unplug from politics. Yeah. Go watch some cats. Okay. Well, it's one thing to unplug from politics. It's another thing to watch cats the movie. You know. We've hit a point where there's football on every hour of every weekend. Which game am I turning off to see, you know, midnight? <laughs> and the kids are sleeping. I, we'll see. It's going to be like 10 o'clock Saturday night, and I'm going to be thinking, all right, well, I guess cats. Is, is it finally cats? And I'm going to look around like, oh, Hawaii's at home. You're like, cats. <laughs> And then you're going to remember a Kurt Thomas movie. Yeah. <laughs> Dig out Jim Cotta. It's probably, I'm sure I still have it on DVD somewhere. I just want to know what the pommel horse was supposed to be or if it was just like a real... It's like, part of the town square. You're looking for logic in a film that had <laughs> none of it. None of it. He but, walks through a village that's the village of the crazies. He looks over at a house there's, or a church. There's a priest standing in front of the church. The priest waves. The priest turns his back to walk into the church the priest has no back on his priest garb. His ass is hanging out. Well, yeah. You want logic? There, he, that's Jim Cotta logic. It was a hot day. Hey, look. It was a hot day. Priest butts hanging out. <laughs> Thomas Flair. Thomas Flair. <laughs> Crazy's going at him one at a time, so they can all be killed by the Thomas Flair by the little shoe hitting them as he swings by. Oh, God. He killed them with his flare? They all seem to drop dead. I mean, they, you know, it's one of those films where they they attack one at a time because you wouldn't want to attack in a group. You want to attack one at a time. The flare that kills. And each time you get hit with a little shoe and then drop and then sort of disappear so the next guy can run in. Oh, makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, man. Well, um... On that note, if anybody else wants to watch Cats and get, deliver us a full report on that, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah, compare notes. And compare notes. All right. Thanks for joining us this week. Yeah. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, the Google Store, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. See you next time.